And so <laughs> restaurants fit into that hospitality niche of, uh, of my coverage, uh, though I must admit right up there with the beer industry, it's, uh, it's probably about my favorite thing to cover. Um, I, uh, we tend to, our, our mission statement, if you will, as a paper is we tend to write things uh, that help inform business owners and business leaders how to be better business owners and business leaders, whether that's things uh, that they can take that other businesses are doing well, that other businesses are not doing well, um, things that just uh, affect them a lot from the policy standpoint. And so uh, I look at restaurant covers as a chance to uh, talk about an industry that everyone likes to read about. People will read restaurant stories even if their business is nowhere near the restaurant industry. But I tend to look for trends in the industry uh, and what um, – uh, what's going on in, in the bigger picture of food service in Denver. Very business specific stories. Unfortunately, I don't get to do any reviews, but uh, I tend to like to write about finances of restaurants a lot, uh, see what's working, who's expanding, why they're expanding, um, and then just uh, just general stories about what the industry means to the greater Denver economic picture. Thanks. I'm to tell us a little bit about you. I'm Andra, the, I'm Andra Zeppelin. I am um, the editor at Eater Denver. Eater is an um, online news um, source for dining. The Denver chapter started about three and a half years ago. I took my position in September. It'll be this September. It will be three years. Um, so Eater does doesn't do reviews, at least not on the local site. Um, and uh, we basically look for anything newsy in the restaurant and dining world. So. Everything from openings and closings and chef shuffles and new bars and interesting cocktails and um, trends and everything that goes along with that. Thanks. Amanda? Um, so I'm the food editor at 5280 Magazine. Um, the magazine has had food coverage since it launched in 1993. We hired our first critic um, with, along with that issue. Um, actually, our first review was Barolo Grill, which is kind of funny to back on. Yeah. Well, I wasn't there then, but <laughs> um, but for it to be Barola Bro, um, shows you how long that's been, that restaurant's been around. Um, so we cover, we have two arms um, of 5280. We have the magazine, obviously, so a monthly magazine um, that has, obviously, food and drink in there. And then we also have a blog. But we think of ourselves as more of a magazine with a blog component to it. Um, we're really trying to drive people to the, the print publication. We don't blog nearly as much as Westward or Eater, um, but that's by design. Um, we're a magazine first. We hope that our blog, which covers you know, lifestyle stuff um, and trends, less the openings and closings, more kind of nuggets of information that you can, you can take, um, like a Best Bites or something like that, something that's a specific dish that you can go out and get, um, or Q&A, things like that. Um, but we think of it as a continuation of the conversation that the magazine has already started. Okay, thanks. Um, and you guys can answer these questions if you're interested. If you're not interested, don't bother. So um, I'm not going to make you each answer. So, but the first one I will, and that is, so what's a good start? What's a good story for 5280? I mean, that's really important for these guys to understand. The um, Doing what I do for a living, I have clients that say, well, we just spent, you know, $40,000 on new carpeting. Can you get somebody to write a story about, about the remodel? And it's like, yeah, let me call Walter Cronkite. I mean, sorry, that's an ancient reference. Let me call uh, <laughs> Lester Holt. Um, you know, I think that, that it's important for you to understand that these four folks and anybody else in the media have a hole to fill every day um, or every week or every month. They have space that they need so you're giving them great stories is a service to them just as much as it's a service to you. But it can't be air. It has to be real. And so tell us a little bit about what's a good story. So for us, I mean, I look at stories in two ways. I look at them whether they're a blog story or whether they're a print story. For the magazine, it has to be something that can live the life of, the, of that issue. So, you know, roughly 30 days and ideally longer because a lot of people um, hang on to their issues. Um, for years, actually. Um, <laughs> so it has to have something that is more than just a real quick little pal um, for the magazine. Um, I really like sort of the human element. My section, um, Eat and Drink, 
we have lots of little things, so there aren't a lot of human kind of essay stories in there. But for me, that's what I would love to. I would love to fill my pages with that kind of stuff. We do have a restaurant review, which in a way is an essay, not really, but you know it is for the person. Um, for the blog, I'm definitely looking for the quicker hits, um, the stuff that you know, go and get this right now, or um, you know, something that is again that little nugget I was talking about. Something you can kind of take that information, you can put it in your pocket, you can go to that restaurant, pull out that information, and say. I'm going to get this dessert, or I'm going to get um, this cocktail because 5280 said so. Uh, yours is a little broader. I also look at the stories in two two different ways, but they're very different than Amanda's. Um, I look at stories as things that readers really want to read about. They want to know where to get the best donuts, where to you know find the best cocktails, where which. What favorite chef of theirs is cooking at what new restaurant, right? So that's like one thing that people are really, really um, dying to read about. And I look at the other rest of the stories that are closer to my heart, which is the stories that I think people should read about. Um, so I'll give you um, a couple of examples just from the last couple of days. Um, the Cat Cafe <laughs> escaped their lawsuit, right? So this is something that for some reason, makes people crazy. They, they just have an endless appetite for the cat cafe and anything related to the cat cafe. So I will, read, I will write about the cat cafe. On the other end of the spectrum, Steubens, um, Investa, and Ace had a team of people running the Boulder Boulder that had 56 people in it. Um, it was superb. It was a great party. They all drove up there together. They ran the race. Then they went out for drinks. Then they all drove to get Back, back together to Denver. This is inspirational, I think, for people in the industry. It's, um, it's cool that a restaurant group makes, creates that kind of bond among the, the employees. And they've had this like really cool health initiative in the last couple of years that brings a, a new element to an industry that's not necessarily known for its health habits. So that's sort of like the, the spectrum, you know, People want to read about this, and people that stories that I think people should read about. Great. Um, I like to think of it if it's interesting to me if it's first, if it's unique, or if it's exemplary of a trend. Um, if it's first, I don't necessarily mean the first restaurant you're opening. Um, I have a hard time writing about a new restaurant because I get so many pitches every day about those. And uh, it would be all I write about if that was it. But if you are a restaurant that is uh, opening your first in a concept, if you're going from a single restaurant to a uh, to a small chain, or if you are opening out of state for the first time, or you're doing something that you're the first restaurant going into a hot new development, like say Union Station, um, that that is interesting to me. Um, if you are absolutely unique, and, and I realize everyone who owns a restaurant thinks they are unique in, in the same way, and I respect that. Uh, I do. I mean, because if it was my baby, I would think it was the only thing in the world, too. But it has to be really unique. You're serving a food nobody else in Denver is. You're, you're the first restaurant serving this kind of ethnic cuisine. Um, you're, uh, you're the first restaurant that, uh, you know, everybody sits in bumper cars, something like that. Or the Cat Cafe. Yeah, but she's, she's really had the market on the Cat Cafe <laughs> story. So, but, um, or the other thing that I really like is the example of a trend. You know, maybe you can't call me up and say, hey, I'm the first barbecue restaurant in town. Clearly you can't. Um, but if you say, well, look, there are about five of us that are using this new type of meat that are ex importing it from far away. This is new to Denver. You can actually cite the trend. That is a really interesting story because that lets me write something that is a bigger picture that tells us more about both the restaurant community and you know maybe a little bit more about the business community in general. So, um, so I always tell people, if you want to call me and pitch a story, don't be afraid to cite other businesses that are doing this too. I'll remember who brought the story to me, and certainly I'm going to interview you, but it actually helps to move it along if you can say this is part of a bigger picture. And so, excuse me, but what is the trend? I mean, this, some people tell me that it has, there has to be three examples really? of three. That's the rule. For me, <laughs> it's the beginning. Yeah, three is the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, one of our old reporters used to joke, two is a trend, three is a phenomenon. Uh, but, uh, 
but I mean, just anything you're just starting to see come along and, and can cite okay. a, a number of locations. So I, we get that question quite often. And what's the trend? Uh, I think the best stories, and it's not just restaurant stories, but in any field, are the ones that have a surprise. So not only is the reader going to find a surprise, but the reporter is surprised as they're doing reporting. And so they're breaking out of preconceived notions, and they find something good. The Cat Cafe, for example, and none of us have really gotten as far as we should in the fact that the owner is a lawyer. I mean, hello, she couldn't figure out that this was going to be a problem, and I know our writer <laughs> failed to mention that. And um, that all of you who are in the restaurant business, you know liability is a big issue. And when you are starting that business, you look into it. So with the Cat Cafe, that was kind of the surprise that the lawyer didn't anticipate this. Um, let me go to your carpeting. Your, there's, yeah. You are going to be able to find a story in almost anything, but unfortunately you're going to probably have to do a lot of the thinking before you pitch it because the person you're talking to has just talked to 75 other people on the phone yeah. about their carpeting and their cats. So the carpeting, <laughs> if you're thinking about it, um, how long has that restaurant been in business? What's the lifespan of decor at a restaurant? Why would you have to pull up carpeting? Um, you know, that's one thing. Is it putting off toxic, uh, toxic fumes and making people sick? That's, of course, the angle I would want. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is the carpeting causing problems? Is the carpeting the new color that every restaurant in Denver is suddenly going to, you know, teal and puke or whatever? Locally grown. Maybe it's locally alpaca, grown. that's what I was going to say. Is it made from an alpaca uh, or an alpaca ranch somewhere in Colorado? So if you can think of angles that might you might have to come up with six, and no one's going to bite on them anyway. But if you've given some thought to the fact that, hey, you guys are real, if it's a great place to smoke pot, you know, sitting on this carpet, you might pitch westward. I mean, so there are going to be angles. So look specifically at who you're talking to, and there might be the opportunities, even in something as, yes, boring as $40,000 worth of new carpeting, there might be an angle there. Super. Um, where do great stories come from? Who, who sends them to you? You can answer if you want. You don't have to. Nobody sends them to me. Nobody ever sends you a great story? Very rarely. I, press releases, sorry for those of you who are in that industry, but um, press releases usually don't generate stories for us. They might right. generate a quick little blog post or something, but they're not going to generate, um, for the most part, a story. For me, stories come from people calling me with a tip, texting me with a tip, you know, just being out there in the world and, and eating at restaurants and talking to restaurant people and just you know, just kind of being in the midst of everything. That's that's how I find my stories, or how our writers find their stories. It's, it's much more just kind of on the ground, being immersed in the industry, as opposed to waiting for releases to come across. Is there much reporting going on in the world, and the difference between just waiting for stories to come in and reporting? You guys can explain, but but um, is there much reporting going on for 5280? I mean. Are they yeah. out there searching all the time? Well, I think anyone who's a reporter at heart is interest, has a nose for news and is, is interested in you know, just something that has an interesting angle, you know, whether it's carpeting or cat cafe or whatever it might be. <laughs> but I do think that I don't do a whole lot of reporting until I know I'm really interested in it. I kind of soak it all up. I, I take notes. I think about it. And it's only when I'm really interested in a subject that I'll go and chase it down. That's when my reporting really and truly starts. But that doesn't mean I'm not listening and paying attention um, and reading all the stuff that comes through or Twitter or whatever it is. Um, but very rarely does something come from a press release. So mechanically, how? I'm sorry. And, and I just want to add to that. And maybe you'll agree with this. Maybe you'll disagree. But I want to say that doesn't mean it doesn't come from a press person, at least in, in, in my mind. Like you can, I, I don't know whether we're looking at it, a room full of restaurateurs, a press person, or a mix here. But, um, but like if a press person called me and said, hey, there's something really interesting I want to tell you. Yeah, I'm going to be interested. I mean, I'm probably more interested than if it came in in the form of a press release. But just something that went out to all four of us plus 12 other people is more likely to be banged out quickly as well because, you know, we all want to, we don't want to be too excited on it. Definitely, the conversation, you know, that from press people, from whomever, from industry people, from from your neighbor who just happened to discover this new brewery or restaurant, all of those conversations is where things come from, less so an email or a piece of paper that comes across. Sure. Yep. A 
for restaurant stories, the best tips certainly come from the restaurants themselves. But usually when you're drinking at the bar and talking to the bartender <laughs> who's telling you something they shouldn't. But um, yeah. and, the, and the other thing is also a lot of restaurateurs who re regularly send you their press releases might also know the kinds of stories that interest you and will call and say, hey, this has nothing to do with me, but I just heard this interesting thing about a new restaurant that's opening. So you can build a relationship with press people by knowing what they're interested in, and then the next time you send a press release about your own business, they'll remember. So we collect all those press releases. We use them for listings, so we probably put 40 restaurant listings up a week, but we also look for trends in those press releases too. So you don't want to not send the press release. So let's talk about the mechanics of that. How do you get, how do you accept stuff? You, you said people like, you like people to call you on the phone. I think I've called you twice ever probably. Or email me or text me. I mean, <laughs> however you're most comfortable in pitching is, is best for me. I mean, I don't answer my phone all the time, but I answer my messages. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And whatever, it's not facts. I mean, I don't, does anyone even facts? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the <laughs> pinball tournament, June 12th. They just got a fax set. Don't fax it. Very 80s. <laughs> hey, I know you have a way you like stuff to come in. So, do you have society or? We like things to come in through. We have a dedicated email address, cafe at westward.com, because if it comes via email, and we're not fussy, we don't care. <laughs> There's someone who sent something. If it's just a note says, here's the who, what, when, where. If you want more, get it back with us. But the great thing about email is you can forward it to the six or seven different people at the paper who might be interested in it. So you can send it to the calendar department. You can send it to our managing editor, who's the beer writer. You can send it to Mark Antonation, who oversees most of the food stories. You can send it to a reviewer. You can send it in a lot of ways. We have people who send things, put a post a message on Facebook which basically means, hello, editor, now take the time to cut and paste this to respond. It's just not as easy. So email is forwardable. So that's the easiest. But we don't care. Just send it to the generic email address. Unlike personnel or just lazy editors who don't look at their personal email, that address never changes. So we can just forward it. We probably get 2,000 emails a day in our press. In our press can, I add, can I add one thing to that? Please. For us, we. It drives me nuts when someone will send it to every single editor. When it's clearly a food story, or it's a music story, or it's an every, architecture Every single story. editor at 5280. Every single editor at 5280. And that is just obnoxious. So find <laughs> out who the editor should be that you, or maybe two at most editors that, it, that you should be sending it to, and send it to those. But people. don't you have a generic editorial address too? Do we have news yeah. at 5280? Yeah. yeah. Um, but they'll do news and then they'll do it to the entire editorial staff, yeah. including our interns, which is... And then don't tell you that they're doing that. No, and it's just, uh, what it does is it irritates you, so even if it's a good idea or a good pitch, it just, by that time you're so irritated because every single person has reforwarded it to you, so you now have 85 emails about this one event. So I would just be a little more, um, you know, targeted. I think, I think it shows that you're, you're smarter. And, that, and that's basically what happens to us. Uh, we, have, we also have a generic email address. It's denveradener.com. Um, but it isn't seldom that I will receive an email, and then 10 minutes later I'll get an email from one of the contributors that says, hey, I got this email about this thing happening. Should, do you want me to cover it? When I just received the same email. And I, I suppose you, know, you either send it to the Denver on or you send it to me, and I can then go ahead and assign it to somebody, or if you have a relationship with one of our contributors, by all means, you know, chase that person down, but don't chase me down at the same time because we're going to run into each other and we'll, you know, it's just a waste of time. So the more the merrier doesn't really work in the field of PR. I guess you put it that way. You have to assume well, everyone's going to afford it. To and we, I mean, we assume that we talk to each other. I think that's... Sure, sure. There's probably an important point here, and, and that is, well, there is a point, point, point here, um, that it's really critical for you to understand when you're sending out information who it is that you're sending it to and what they write about. So Kyle Wagner, who used to be the, the, the restaurant critic at Westward, would talk about how Kellogg's would send her <laughs> press releases about, you know, the newest kind of cornflakes, and um, she never wrote about cornflakes, ever. Ever. She was a restaurant critic. She wrote about restaurants. And so it's really critical. Ed talked about the 17 beats that he covers at the Denver Business Journal. If 
you're within one of those beats, don't send that to necessarily to his editor. Um, if you're sending a, a restaurant story to the Denver Post, figure out who might be interested in writing that writing that story. So you're not wasting your time by sending it to 100 people. I know that you can blanket the world with emails because it's easy, and um, certainly there are PR firms, especially that that send out e emails to you know thousands of people at a time. They're generally not going to be read. And so if you send a, a personal note to a writer who is, might be interested in that story, you, you just have a whole lot better chance of getting that read. And, and I'll add this one thing, and I bet everybody probably agrees with me here. Um, I don't have time to do every story. Even if it's a decent story, I might tell you, I really appreciate this. I can't do this right now. I'm buried on a project. Don't turn around then and try to shop it to another <laughs> reporter at the same publication. Oh, yeah. Because once people start reporter shopping, it goes from the, oh, I like that, I'll get to it later pile, to the, forget it, we're not taking another pitch from you pile. So, um, yeah. And on the same token, I can't believe that we have to say this, except we all make mistakes. Read your press release before you send it, or just your note, because I, it seems to be much worse than it used to be, but if one out of ten, I'll get a correcting press release, yeah. sometimes a minute later, sometimes a day later. But if we've already added it to our listing database, we're suddenly doubling the amount of work we have to do on that. I just got one for, you know, the subject line is dinner June 16th, and the attached thing is for May 7th. Uh, oh yeah, you got it too. So there's all these people saying, wow, these guys aren't really paying close attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a kind of two-part question. So can an independent restaurant um, survive and thrive without a PR firm? Absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, We'd like them to be in touch with us in some way, but it doesn't mean it has to be a PR firm. Sure. I mean, you know, anyone on staff can call and say, hey, I got a good idea. And eventually, because even if you have a PR firm, the first thing we're going to want to do is get past the PR firm and set up time to talk with, yeah. you know, the owner, the general manager, the cook, someone like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have any sense of whether a PR firm, there's a bias against PR firms? in terms of covering restaurants. Against bad Some PR firms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I will speak to a list of the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for example, the PR firm that sends you a press release a week later says, can you possibly do anything with it? And like, Google or I did five days ago. Right. So you just have to be really careful with that. But some there's some really, really wonderful PR firms in town. There's some smart restaurateurs who are also very good at it doing them themselves. And I think Denver's a small enough town that you can establish a relationship if you're a really unique restaurant, you've got cool things going on, you're not going to bug people all the time. But if you don't want to hire a PR person, but you've got a pretty competent staff, you can do without. But PR people also do great jobs for a lot of restaurants that just could never handle it themselves. Sure. Um, give us some sense of lead time. So, because they're going to be very different across this, this panel. So, one of the frustrating things that they'll tell you about, they have a lot of frustrating things to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> is, is getting stuff so late that they can't use it? And, and if you get a good item and it's too late to use, then you've wasted a lot of everybody's time. So give us some sense on lead times. You want me to start? Sure. Because ours will your, be the worst. Yours are. <laughs> um, Not as bad as Sunset Magazine. That's true. So we are, we're three to four months out, but in all reality, on a lot of things, we're planning a lot earlier. So for my September story, I started planning it in January. Um, that's a package, that's a cover package. Um, for shorter things, we are more, you know, three months out or so. We are wrapped, our, our July issue goes to press, um, basically like tomorrow. So that means that everything was done essentially a month ago or so on that. So it is frustrating when we get some really great stuff that we would like to, you know, pitches that we'd like to be able to put in the magazine, and we just can't because it's wrapped, it's already been edited, it's in design or whatever. That is a place where we can pick something up for our blog. But sometimes the, the stories warrant more, and just to do a blog for us, we, we try and figure out other ways to, to do it. You know, maybe we put it in a later issue or something, but it may not be as relevant to a September issue. Um, so just be wary and aware of 
of our time frame. We're, we'll definitely be the worst on the panel. Yeah, we're we're, we're pretty instant, um, depending on you know the day and the story and how interesting interesting it is to us. Um, that's the the beauty of online. You know, an hour later I can have something up on the blog. But um, you know, I think events. Um, I probably that's the bulk of the emails I receive. Every, the hundreds of emails I receive every day is, you know, wine dinner with so and so winemaker at this place. Say today is Wednesday and the event is on Friday. Or can I get something? You know, can I can I post something about an event on Saturday? Probably by Wednesday afternoon I can't. So I think on events it's good. It's a good policy to send them. The, 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 as soon as you know, send them out. Um, a week, two weeks, the, the more lead time, the better. And the more information, the better. The more information, the better. And I'll, I'll add something to that. Um, when you have things that are, you know, cursory information, um, the date, the time, the place, who it is, what kind of dinner, how much it costs. If, you, um, if you're a PR company who hired a design firm, created a really cool flyer, um, that I can't copy and paste from, and you attach it to this email, instead of writing me a paragraph that tells me the date and the time, it's super annoying. Um, and it's super annoying because these are not things that are, you know, it's, it's, I, I used to, in my legal job, I had two computer screens. So it was easy to open a flyer here and just type it into the next one. But I don't do that anymore. Um, I have one computer screen, and I, I go from one window to the other trying to copy it, you know, retype this information. It's so it seems so fancy, you know, to have this like super cool flyer, but I don't know if you made if it was made for social media or for whatever purpose. It just was not made for a press release. If you have a press or God no, a Google document or some like really intricate way of sending information. You have an event, just those five lines, just type them up in an email and send them out and everyone will be happy. With, with the address. With the address. So rarely do things actually contain an address. Yeah. And that's that's just annoying. And if there's a link to the event, please include that. It's really the, the stuff that you would want to have included as the organizer of the event. Sure. Yes. Um, we have a weekly publication. It comes out every Friday. Uh, we have to have our copy in by Monday on that, so it's a four-day lead time. But the truth is uh, each reporter only gets one page, essentially one to two stories on that page, and I plan those out weeks in advance. So, um, you know, I, I, if it's something you want to see in print, I need a little lead time. Uh, if it's something for online, which is where 90% of our stories go, I don't necessarily need lead time, but like they said, you know, don't call me at 4.30 and say, hey, we've got an event at 6, want to come down? <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, a couple, couple days is, is always helpful on something like that. And, and I will say, too, if, if you're sending out a release, um, and you can include photos. While the field of reporters is diminishing, it's not diminishing as quickly as the field of photographers is. We have one for our entire paper. So uh, if you can supply photos, that is always a big help at moving something up on what I can do. And we'll add to photos. So um, our lead time is probably three weeks to three minutes. The three weeks uh, lead time is anything you really want considered for print. If we're for our calendar, we'll probably put a couple food stories in in the calendar, and three weeks helps. And all our deadlines are in print, so uh, at the end of the calendar section, so you can find them. Figuring out what we want up, our reviewer is always out eating, and and she probably turns things in a week before they show up because we don't want the restaurant to go out of business before we or to have the chef change, which has happened too, before we go to press. But sometimes if there's a good scoop and someone's in the office, we'll get it up in three minutes. Um, if it's an event, obviously you know that it's been planned longer than three minutes before the event starts, so we'd like a little lead time, or else no one's going to be able to go out and buy tickets. But for photos, this just came up today. Um, we love it if you could provide photos, but I'm wondering if you don't also have to provide copyright documentation, because uh, I can say that we posted a photo that the Denver Post also posted today, which, as it turned out, the um, restaurant, the eatery, uh, which provided it through their PR person to us and probably everyone else at this table, didn't have the rights to it, and <laughs> and, but they, and I don't think the PR person knew, and the um, and who knows? I don't think the eatery knew too, because if you're buying a photo, there's so many different layers of rights, 
and you really have to be sure. Are you buying the right to put it on your website? Are you buying the right to put it on your menu? Are you buying the right to also give that photographer's work to media outlets? You've got to establish that. And in this case, we, our readers are so smart. You love it. Denver diners are smart and fun, but they will bust you in a heartbeat. And this reader actually figured out that the photo that we had put up was from um, Gourmet, like 12 years ago or something. Oh, yeah. Because now you can do Google Image Hunt, and we found it. And we're like, holy moly. So I told the PR person we took it down. But uh, you've got to be really careful. So if you can assure the press people, hey, this photo is fine to use. We can guarantee it. Just use this credit. It is very helpful because publications are going to get more and more scared to use photos supplied to them. The other thing, too, if I can add to that, um, it'd be great if you can, if you are sending photos, if you can send horizontal and vertical. Um, our blog, for example, we can only use horizontal. Um, Us too. So that's really helpful, just to have an option. Um, and you, on the blog, will use photos from other people, but not in the magazine. Almost. Yeah. No, I mean we shoot, we shoot stuff in the magazine. Right, right. Um, let's talk about corrections real quick, because you talked about mm -hmm. this this correction on a photo. So, you know, the web is forever. Um, what's the what's the methodology for making a correction, taking something down from the web? I, I know you've got lots. Uh, you know, our basic policy is we do not take anything down. We don't rewrite history, but we will correct anything that's actually wrong um, in, online and we'll note that we've corrected it, unless it's just a stupid typo, in which case we'll just fix it. But if we have um, someone's, the name of a partner wrong, something like that, we will usually note that we have corrected it. But if we get something actually wrong, we, we hope People should get in touch with us and we'll correct it. If it's an argument over whether or not your food is really delicious and our critics said it wasn't, we had a really fabulous conversation going with the uh, Lo Stella Trattoria, uh, Lo Stella last week. And unfortunately, all those comments have disappeared because we have a new commenting system. But he disagreed with a lot of the review, but it was a matter of opinion as opposed to fact. So. Okay. Who's the arbiter of what's right and what's not? Sometimes a lawyer. Um, that's not very often. You know, usually reasonable people can come to an agreement uh, if there's a mistake or not. So, Ed, anything on corrections? Um, no, I mean our policy: if it's wrong in the paper, even if I left one O out of John's name, I guess you only have one O. Um, but uh, then, uh, then we'll, we'll we'll correct it in the paper the next week. If I did the same thing on the web, I'll probably just go in and change his name. It'll put it back up, and you'll never know the difference. We only note when it's corrections of major facts, like the 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 industry that brought me a study showing arguing that they had a 700 and 40 something million dollar economic impact on uh, state of Colorado and then called me back a couple hours after I published said, oh, we were wrong. It was 436 million. Um, that will forever be on our site as we fix this. And by the way, it wasn't our fault. Uh, so, but, uh, but for the most part, if it's just a little detail, we'll just swipe it off the, uh, the web and put the correct one up. All right. Great. Um, Patty and Amanda, just, just for you guys, the, the critic, how does the critic decide where they're going to go? And is it helpful for restaurateurs to say, hey, we've been open for six months or six years or six decades, and it's time for your critic to stop by? You know, we have the basic rule, which is we don't review until a place has been open three months. We hold, we still hold to that old time honor tradition. We try to balance ge geography, kind of food, um, price point, so that we get, we cover the whole metro area. We don't want to just review relatively new restaurants, so sometimes we return to old ones, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge, is deciding when it's time to return to a restaurant you might have reviewed before, like, I wonder how many times we've reviewed Barolo Grill over the years. Um, so I would say the only, any reviewer knows who's opened. They know exactly who's opened over the last six months. So they're going to have an idea of who they want to review. The question is, if you've been open for a while and think you want the reviewer to visit again, it's not a bad idea to say, hey, I think it's worth coming to look at us again, but you should give them a reason why. A new chef, a new menu, that new $40,000 in carpeting. Uh, but, there, but maybe a reason to come in and look. Well, you only have 50 reviews a year. You only have 12. So, um, you know, what, you had 300 restaurants and bars? Opening last year, and you're reporting that in Westbrook. So, 
So ours is all based on calendar. Um, we wait for the three months as well, um, and it's all we have. We have a Google Doc that has all the restaurants that are opening with their date, with the three months date that they have been open, and that's when they're fair game to start visiting. So our critic can't visit a restaurant before that time, um, even for you know off the clock. They just can't go. Um, so it's all derived from that calendar. And again, I mean, you know, we have 12 places to review here. So they really do need to be the newer relevant restaurants that people are excited about and either getting their money's worth or aren't getting their money's worth, but have the buzz regardless. Um, for places that we want to go back to or less expensive places, like kind of eat cheap, sort of maybe some ethnic eateries, whatever, we have other venues in the magazine where we cover that or we will cover them on the blog. Um, I love it when I get a store, you know, someone calling and say, you should come back to my restaurant because we've done, you know, this or whatever. We have a new pastry chef or, or whatever. And oftentimes we'll, we'll go in there and sometimes that'll turn into a story or it'll, it'll turn into a blog or it'll turn into a number, you know, by the numbers kind of thing, something, um, which isn't, I'm sure, as satisfying as re-reviewing a place for the restaurant. But it's, we are saying we're paying attention. We're there. Plus, you have best new restaurants. You have top twenty-five restaurants. You have YouTube or yeah, we have, we have you know, several other restaurant. issues that are yeah. relevant. I would think to to restaurant tours out here. So we're interested in being there. Um, let's talk a little bit about the perception of just for a second about the perception of dining. Denver's national perception of dining. Excuse me, the national perception of Denver's dining scene. Um, which some of us have spent a lot of time over the last. 10 years trying to elevate that national perception because some quantitative research that we got that we never got that the Denver restaurant scene was not very well received nationally. And um, so do you have a sense of, you talk to national reporters, are they calling you, are they asking you what's going on in Denver, that kind of stuff? I think the perception is absolutely changing. I mean, I think anyone in this room would know that the perception is changing just within the <coughs> side of things too. but. I mean, we're starting to get all these different awards. Travel and Leisure just wrote up um, Soak and Genuine and Mercantile and Station. I mean, that's, it's an international list of the best restaurants that were in that are in train stations. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty huge. I think there's a lot of a lot of folks on the coast and in, on the East Coast in particular that are starting to look at, at Denver as sort of a Portland or an Austin, this kind of hotbed of of places where there's this amazing lifestyle that there's so many people living here because they want to be here for the lifestyle and they also want good dining and they're starting to recognize that. I mean, you see that with James Beard, you see that with all different kinds of things. But yeah, I, I do think the perception is changing and certainly when the reporters come, like Food & Wine comes through to put on the Food & Wine <coughs> year, they are stopping in Denver and they're spending some time there and, and going to restaurants. So, and they've been doing that for a while, but now you're seeing the restaurants really in the last five years, four years, show up in the magazine, too. And do you share info with other businesses? Because there's a whole slew of business journals. So are people calling you about restaurants from other business journals? No, really. But the interesting thing that I've found is I do a lot of coverage of uh, the publicly owned restaurant chains here. And, and if I'll be doing a national story, I mean, someone from Technomics is going to say, well, you should know. Denver is the home of fast casual restaurants, you know, the, the city that's the, uh, the home base for Chipotle, Noodles, Qdoba, Smashburger, a lot of concepts that are just getting up and going now. So I think that's one of Denver's uh, perceptions, that we were really one of the catalysts to the national fast casual movement and, and, uh, and the new foods that are coming out of that. Andre, are you talking to, I mean, you're in general. I, I mean, I definitely do, yeah. Um, and I think for, you know, eaters, reach in other cities is uh, pretty broad and we have a you know, we have a national site that also writes stories so I definitely share ideas with our national writers constantly but I also get emails and phone calls and tweets from you know chefs from big cities or reporters from big cities who are coming through Denver and asking where to go you know what's what's the new hot spot what's interesting who's Who's doing some cool stuff in Denver? And so, and it's nice to see that people are taking an interest in visiting, and I am excited to see more of that. Well, you know, um, 
I used to say that Denver was like the Sally Field of cities. Whenever we got any national attention, it was like they like us, they really like us. And it is true, it is great to get national attention, whether it's for journalism or whether it's for a chef or a restaurant. And that travel and leisure item was great to take because those restaurants in Union Station really are wonderful. Um, we certainly see plenty of lists that obviously some national publication has thrown together and I'm trying to remember which was the one it was in the USA Today when two of the restaurants had just closed when they were talking about the top ten in Denver. So, uh, you know, it really, it's, it's meaningful to a point. You guys can't pay your bills with a story in travel and leisure unless suddenly it sends a lot of people to Denver. You have to have your loyal local eaters too. but. To have our scene recognized nationally, internationally, is great because people here are working really, really hard. They're not just serving up cynical piles of meatloaf. They are really trying to improve the food on the, on the plates here in Denver, and that's exciting to report on. And even though we also are going to cover what's just happening, what's happening locally, that's our bread and butter. You, you love it when, when people you like and institutions you like are getting attention. I believe the cat cafe has. Cynical people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can talk, I can ask questions forever, but um, any yeah. questions from you guys out there for, for these folks? These guys are pros; they know what they're doing. Guys have been doing it for too long, seven years. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a big deal. I just got a quick question. I think mostly for Amanda. Is it worthwhile for people to write editorial calendars to have such long? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just for the webinars. Purpose. Let me just say that uh, Debbie was asking about editorial calendars. It's it's definitely worthwhile. We don't put everything on our editorial calendar because, frankly, we don't know um, everything that's going to be in there. But we always put our cover story, and we usually put two other features. And if there's any special inserts, like a you know top dentist or something like that, um, but that can be very helpful just in terms if you're looking to be part of a a cover package. For example, um, uh, food lovers. Guide to Denver is my September package, and that's the one I've been working on since January. So that was on our editorial calendar um, for the September issue. So it, it can be. It's not going to capture the small stuff, but it'll capture the big stuff. And I have to say, we don't have an editorial calendar because we like that surprise element. <laughs> but we also have instructions on exactly how to how to get into every section of the paper, when to email, who to email. So if you leave me your email address, I'll send it to you. Kind of the care and feeding of the food section. Great. We have a very spare editorial calendar. Um, it's, it's one that um, covers all the eater sites. Um, and it has, you know, three, four items every month. And they may be, you know, cocktail week or pizza week or best patios or best mm -hmm. airport dining or best burgers. Um, and these are stories that we plan far ahead and that every, each one of the 27 eater sites will publish at the same time for their respective city. We don't do any food specific um, things on our calendar, but we give away a ton of awards, whether it's 40 under 40, Outstanding Women in Business, C-Suite Awards, and they generally, you see most of these awards going to tech companies, lawyer firms, uh, a lot of government agencies like to apply for these, um, and, and we only can give awards to people who apply. So I encourage you, look at our uh, Denver Business Journal, have a list of all the awards we give out, nominate people from your company, your industry. I'd love to see more restaurants in that list. And let me also do an addendum because Tracy Contreras, our associate publisher is here and she'll kill me. We actually do have a calendar. We do plan some things. We have supplements, special issues that are not the cover of the paper, but special issues like for a year. We also have events that have special issues related to them. So there is a calendar from the very organized business side of those things. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yes, I'm Ashley Allen Tegan T. And we're actually involved in about 300 restaurants um, around town and regionally. And I kind of wanted to know how you guys would take maybe a product inside of a restaurant or maybe take a story inside of a restaurant and kind of is that something maybe that the restaurant tours would pitch, or you know, I would call and just say, hey, we're in these many restaurants. Oh, great, I'm already writing a review on this restaurant. I can plug you in. What is the product again? Tea. I sell oh, got tap tea. You is it local? It is local. You're available at Marzix, though, too, right? You're available. So, I, love your, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. your Roybus. Your Roybus is awesome. Thank so, you. but we wouldn't. We wouldn't. We 
wouldn't cover it from the restaurant side of things. We would cover it from the retail side. Because okay. it has to be, for us, it has to be something that the average consumer can go out to Safeway or to Marzix or wherever mm -hmm. and go and get this thing instead of having to go to a certain restaurant to get it. Mm -hmm. As a sort of a blanket statement, I guess there's probably times where that wouldn't necessarily apply, but for something like tea, it wouldn't matter if you said, hey, I understand that you're reviewing, you know, Argyle or whatever, and we have your tea, because that's all derived from the critic's experience, and whether she has or hasn't had your tea is totally up, you know, that's not something we would just kind of answer. Okay. And if you go back to what Patty was um, talking about with the carpet, you know, you have a product, and you're, there's all of these restaurants that are using it, and some of them are just serving it as tea, but some of them use it in a cocktail. Oh, yeah. Some of them, uh, you know, make a syrup and use it as to drizzle on a dessert. Some of them sure. use it in some other creative way, right? So you, there's an opportunity for you to say, here's three ways that restaurants are using tea. One of those may be at a restaurant that doesn't use your tea, but that's okay because you can still get your tea in there. So it's just you just have to figure out who you're writing to. Like you know, would never cover tea as you know a product, but if you find a dining restaurant related angle, we would certainly consider it. Or if they, somebody did a tea dinner where every every, every dish has some tea on like the right. Tea or something. I mean, I'd seem you'd be interested from a business it's, perspective it's, if it was. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, we, we, I actually get a fair amount of those pitches, and I rarely uh, do things. I mean, it would have to be some milestone, you know, beyond just, hey, we're, we're serving a bunch of restaurants, you know, maybe, hey, we, we're, we're a local company, and we've just caught on with this national chain, and they're now serving our tea. Uh, and, we're, and, and not only are they serving it, but we are doubling our staff size because of it. Or, you know, we're, you know, the, the only tea that's, that, that's made out of an ancient uh, plant that nowhere else on the earth exists, something like that. But, uh, um, but it would just need to have that real unique pitch to it. But I think what, what the, the good thing about this conversation is um, that idea that you can send one press release to all of us because it's one yeah. fit all of us. You know, Ed needs a specific business angle. I need a specific restaurant angle. Everybody's coverage and lead time and approach is different. So that's that's the that's where you can really make a difference if you tailor those to the specific people you send them to. I just feel like we kind of get the, the back seat, like even if we're in huge cocktail events like Denver Burger Battle where all of the bartenders have to use tea in a cocktail. We're kind of just, you know, trying to find a good angle to be like, hey, don't forget about us. <laughs> of course, there's 35 restaurants in that event and they all think that they get <laughs> because yeah. they're not in the headlines. So. Yeah. Right, it's, and it is called Burger Battle. So what I would say is that's the place that you can create a relationship, meet some of the people who are there, and then follow up with them later. Other questions from out there, Mark? What's up? What do you think is missing in Denver dining or where we need more of? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just looking. I, 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 you know, I have people who come to town, you know, you, like when you, you go to Kansas City, you go to eat ribs. When you, you go to oh. New Orleans, you go eat jambalaya. And I have people come to town and they say, well, what's, what's Denver's food? And oh, that's in Mexico. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, short of Rocky Mountain oysters, there's nothing that stands out. I, I wish Denver had that one particular Denver uh, The Denver um, no, I'm not against the potato, that's but, the thing, but. but so if any of you create the food that becomes Denver's food, that, that would be a good story. Um, but I would say off happy breakfast burritos, absolutely. You know, you can't find other cities where you go door to door with those little foil wrap burritos. It's really unique to Denver. That's really not going to make a big business for most people. I would say interest, there are a lot of interesting ethnic niche, uh, niches that just we really, people are hungry for those interesting eating adventures. Uh, we cannot always go to ramen shops. Uh, but there are a lot of ethnic possibilities, I think, out there that Denver could have. I agree with that. Korean. If anybody wants to open a new generation Korean spot in the Denver like metro area, not far in Aurora, I'll be there every day. I agree. There's a story today somewhere about new generation Korean, but not, but that not is Denver. Denver. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see better pastry programs. Um, I, I feel like Denver's really lacking there right now. There's some good pastry chefs, but as a whole, I just I think that it's really disappointing. And I love dessert, so that like, hurts me to say that. Other questions? Yeah. 
other questions out there? Well, as far as new restaurants go, um, you say you get hit with a bunch of emails every day because there are so many opening. If you aren't serving something extravagant or something like that, maybe you're in a neighborhood or something like what, what would make you stick out besides one of the 300 restaurants opening a year or something? You know, is there anything in particular or is it just if it happens to catch your eye? And I think we we do a lot of a lot of write-ups. So we're, we'll cover a variety of places. If it's not a chain, um, that's a good thing. Um, I mean, I read all of my emails, as many as they are. I open them all, and I read through them. I may not read word by word, but interesting neighborhood spots are great for us. Like, we're very, always very interested in that. So, I, you know, I said, again, you just have to figure out who your audience is, because Ed's probably not going to cover that. Eater and Wester are probably going to cover that. Um, and if you have a really amazing dish, send it to Amanda. Maybe she'll come have it. Yeah. <laughs> and depending on the neighborhood, there are also our smaller neighborhood papers too, and their newsletters, and their, um, you know, their mommies groups. So you don't want to just look for the major media. You want to look for all the other places, especially if you look at, like, look at Lowry. How hungry people are for anything that opens in Lowry, which, if you're on the west side, is pretty far away, but. Um, people cover, cover neighborhoods everywhere because everyone will go around and a good idea in Lowry is going to be transported somewhere else soon. Really and any, any, so any email that I get that says there's a new restaurant opening, it goes onto my list to check out. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to write about you, but it means that I'm going to check it out or someone on my staff is going to check it out. Do we check out all 300, 320 restaurants that open every single year? We do the best we can. Yeah. We may not get to every single one of them. but I log it on my, I have a to-go sheet, and it goes right on there. Um, the other thing is I'm looking for places that have a strong point of view that know who they are. So if you're some, if you're serving, I don't know, cantaloupe with prosciutto and tacos and sushi and, and pho, and pho like, uh, gonna, you're going to go to the bottom of my list in terms of where, who, is gonna, who I'm going to go to first. Um, so that, I think that that's important for any business model, though. Any business needs to know who you are. And so your menu really is, is sort of a, a window into that, that focal point. So I'm looking for a strong menu. And I'll just add, because the, the, the term neighborhood was used a couple times, even think about that as a possibility. If you're going into a neighborhood that's you know, revitalizing its restaurant scene, get together with a couple of the restaurants. Come up with a pitch. I mean, that's a decent story, too. You know? and, uh, round up. Yeah, I mean, a couple months ago, it was actually a retail reporter, but was doing something on how, hey, look, businesses actually want to go to Sunnyside now. Um, you know, that's that's a story in itself. So. Or if you're the oldest restaurant in Sunnyside, now's a great time to do a story on them, too. You know, like, what mm -hmm. sure. build it and they will come kind of thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah's got a little wrap-up, but uh, we certainly appreciate it, and uh, thanks to our panel. And, and I'm sure we all have cards if you want yes, to grab them. Yes, except I don't. Oh. <laughs> but I'll take your email and send you our, uh, our cheat sheet. Oh, all right. Feel free to cut myself. Right. Let's send you a round of applause to all our speakers. I told two cards. Okay. Yeah. Show off. Oh, my God. Are you serious? I just okay. literally like, grabbed the whole thing. Thank you again to our speakers and thank you to Pinnacle Insurance as our sponsor of the series. You'll see that you have a couple of handouts just real quick. If you can just take a couple of minutes to fill out the survey as we are tr continuing to build this program, we'd love to get your feedback on what we can be doing um, that will help you all. We have another educational opportunity, State of the Plate. We're going to be really talking about the legislative agenda for two, two, yeah, 2016. So that's going to be really important, so mark your calendars for that. We also have an immigration law seminar. So um, take those home with you. Check them out. Please drop the survey off uh, before you head out. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you.